guys, we're going to get started. Um, this talk is uh, using Linux to solve business problems. And what it's about, I just want to maybe give a sort of a concept here. What I've been working on the last 18 months or so is doing talks that are not as technical and more geared to people who are sort of on that. They're, they're technical people, but they're also decision makers in business. So, you know, they always say do business at the highest level. So if I'm not talking to the owner of a company or, you know, the, the director of a department, um, try to I'm trying to talk to the people who are going to have some sort of decision making power. Um, the, this talk is basically designed for people like us who are technical, who are going to have to interface with people who are not technical. And how do we go about convincing them to look at Linux uh, to solve their problems? Um, the other thing I want to say is that Linux is a proxy for anything open source. Um, I'm not going to talk about Windows or anything else other than to get people off of that. Uh, although, uh, as you'll see, that may not always be the right way to do things. So this is as much about Linux as it is about FOSS, free and open source software, or FLOSS, free and Linux open source software, um, as it is about the philosophy of open source. So, as, so I want to keep that in, in the background. Um, oops. There we go. So most of you guys probably know me or have heard of me or seen me on a list or seen me here or whatever. Uh, that's my information. It hasn't changed in the time I've been with Plug. Um, that QR code has pretty much the same information as well. If you don't have my information and you want it. Um, any questions so far? Can you bet up a second? What's that? Can you bet up a second? Sure. Please. Sure. Uh, this is, like I said, this is not a very technical talk. It's more discussion based, and hopefully, we'll have some fun and have a good discussion and try to do all that in an hour. Yeah, all right. Okie doke. So, uh, it's hard for me to see this. All right. All right. So, what is this Linux thing about anyway, right? We've all heard of Linux in here, right? Awesome. Never, Mr. BSD. <laughs> Okay, so yeah, minus, <laughs> minus one. So, uh, all right, what is Linux about? All right, so look, in uh, August of 1990, oh, was right into it. <laughs> got the wrong image up, right? Um, I put this in here because this is how a lot of us feel about Linux, right? If, the singularity? If you, that or 1991? <laughs> Some of us a little bit older, so a little bit of both, right? It was a really good looking looks a little too refined. It's a little. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, put that in there. <laughs> I, I, I put that in there because, in, in my experience, let's say, uh, I, I find that those of us who are into the open source stuff, Linux, whatever you want to call it, uh, just sort of the, the general fanboy sort of thing, that's how we felt about Linux, right? We thought the world was going to change after Linux came out. I, I think anyone who's been in this and really deep into it, we thought this was the it. This was the thing that was going to make everything else possible. So what I did, and I actually didn't even realize this myself until I was uh, putting this together last year. Um, so in 2016, Linux had, it, has it, it's, uh, has its, uh, had its 25th anniversary. And I thought, wow, that's, that's a long time. I've been consulting since pretty much 91. Uh, like full, not full time, but in, in one form or another in a, in a steady manner. And um, I said, well, you know, what's really changed? And it sort of was the um, a bit of the spark for this, uh, for this talk. And you know, I have a couple of things up here. I mean, how many people knew that, that date that Linux was released? Yeah. OK, all right. So people, it was in the, you know, it was in there someplace, right? We knew sometime mid to late 90s is when Linux started. Uh, that's probably good enough for most of us. But I thought some of these stats were interesting. I apologize if this is a little, um, a little small to see. but. 22 million lines of code and a new release happening every nine to ten weeks. So that's that's quite a bit. Um, we also what was the other thing? I underline I think the most important point. Um, yeah, the most important. Okay, yeah. It's also one of the most important as the core of the Linux operating system, which runs most modern technology, from Android phones and Chromebooks to nuclear subs, 
space stations, stock exchanges, and much more. So, again, a lot of us know this, okay? This is not really news, but when you're talking to people who don't know this, business people, again, stakeholders, people that are going to be signing checks for you uh, or writing checks to you, some of this stuff might be relevant, right? Because who doesn't want to run the same stuff that's, you know, running a nuclear sub or on a space station or a stock market? And one of the other things on there should be not over 90% of the servers on the internet. We're getting there. Get out of there. <laughs> We're getting there. We're getting there. Right? Overachiever. <laughs> um, so this is some good stuff. But again, if you are a business person, you're like, eh, whatever. You know, so what? Who cares? All right. So we go to the next step. Most of us have heard pretty much everybody on here. Um, how many people know Lenara? Will, don't say anything. <laughs> And Charlie, don't say anything. <laughs> Anybody else? Okay, there we go. Uh, IBM, we've all heard of. Uh, Renesis? Renesis. Renesis, thank you. Yeah. Okay, that one I didn't know either, so all right. Um, Amateur. <laughs> not Linux, you know. Uh, the, <laughs> <laughs> so, Intel, we've all heard of, right? So, you know, top three, right? Intel, Red Hat, well, we can't use none, we can't use unknown, we can't use Lenara, we'll just go with Samsung. Right? So we've got 12.9%, we've got another 8%, so we're at 20.9, and then we've got 3. So about 24% of, uh, I think this is um, the commits to the Linux kernel, are coming from major organizations. Right? So you're in your meeting and you're trying to, you know, get your... Uh, supervisor, whoever, to look at your new little cool thing you did, and then you said, well, Linux and 22 million lines of code, that's not impressing him. Well, you said, well, look, 24%, you, know, you know, Intel, Red Hat, you've heard of them. And they go, yeah. So they're still not impressed. All right, well, let's go a step deeper. This is, this is Ed jumping ahead here. I like to round up, 99.6, that's 100%, right? So, 100% of the 500 most powerful supercomputers run Linux, which means all 500, essentially. Uh, that's, that's a pretty big number, right? Because you can't go above 100%, right? Awesome. So, I think that probably gets um, maybe people thinking, because you go, most people say 100%. Very few things are 100% in life, right? Well, like I said, you round up. It's 100%. 90% of the public cloud. You guys know me, you know I'm not a fan of the cloud, but I can't ignore the fact that 90% is 90%. That's a big number. So again, you're in a meeting, you go, oh, 90%. 62% okay. 62, 62 of the embedded systems market. It's a little, you know, you have to know something about embedded systems, but it's becoming more commonplace. Most people know what a Raspberry Pi is or robotics, and the, there's a board on there, it's doing something. You explain why it's embedded, and 62% you know, of that is Linux. And they go, oh, okay. So, you know, we're starting to get there. You know, some decent numbers. These, all, these numbers are all, you know, vast majority type things, right? The last one I think is really interesting. One, because it has no numbers, and two, it's easy for people to miss why it's significant. Anyone, anyone see it? Linux-based Android overtook Windows as the Internet's most used operating system in early 20, 2017. What's the big deal about that? That took so long? <laughs> yeah, I, I agree. It took so long, right? Android runs on Linux kernel? Say again? Android runs on, on Linux kernel? No, it's the fact that it wasn't the Linux desktop. You're closer. Yes, but you're closer. It says the most used operating system, not mobile operating system. Right? Which means... <laughs> How many of us have an Android phone, right? Mm -hmm. Who has an Apple? Let's do it that way. Let's go. Oh. Do I own one or do I have one? Do you, it's, in your, it's in your pocket right now. Yes. What's in your wallet? <laughs> <laughs> Anyone have an Apple in their yeah, wallet right now? Okay, we've got one, all right? Now, last time, two. Andy. Three. Okay, that's fine. Andy the numbers are still way off, right? Right. So Android's about 60, 70 percent of the market last time I checked, and in this room we had four people out of way more than four people. <laughs> I can't count that quick. Yeah, we're way we're way over that. So thank you. So I think that's probably 
the most relevant point because you can be in a meeting and you can do what I just did. They said, what's in your pocket? And you know there's probably a two out of three chance in an Android. So they go, yeah, I've got an Android. Okay, fine. Let everybody in a room. You do exactly what I just did. This is running the most used operating system <clears throat> since, well, it's called a year. It's 2018 now, right? I don't know. That's kind of, you know, people like show and tell, right? This. What powers your TV? What powers your TV? Yeah, and you can keep, and you can keep on going from there, right? The NSA. So, <laughs> so again, now that, you know, we got to that, well, look, that's three sides of some really good information, right? I mean, look, I don't know what else we can do except um, Linux didn't take over. In fact, um, if Linux is so good, why are we? Why is it? Why is there anything else? I mean, why have we not assimilated the entire planet? Like someone said, Rich, you said, why did it take so long? Yeah. Why? Why is everything not running some variant of Linux? I don't care if it got forked or whatever. But BSD. B, or, okay, you're the one BSD guy. Um, why isn't it all about open source, right? Which is some people still need to print. <laughs> um, that's less of a reason these days. <laughs> some, some people, guess, ten years ago, absolutely. Some, yeah. some people still have punch cards. Some people still need COBOL. Oh right there. boy! See, that's not right. Walt's not even here. <laughs> Early, I know you're recording, but out. I just want to make a point: a lot of Windows applications are are, are originally Hard Linux applications. No, I'll, I'll go into the main reason why. The main reason why is people have been sold that. You have to pay someone if you want reliable support. Yeah, it's the Microsoft Marketing Red Hat yeah. support. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. yeah. But some games fun. work better on one Plus, Red Hat will take your money every year. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Without oh, fail, yeah, they, won't get, they won't get that wrong. <laughs> well, I, you know, I, these are all good because I, I thought the same thing. You know, it's been 25 years. I've been, you know, I, I, <laughs> um, I've got gray now and I've been bald since about 25. So, I'm, you know, I was figuring, look, this is. This is it, this is a wrap, I should be able to relax and retire. And it's not the case. I'm still finding Windows stuff, I'm still finding everything else. Yeah? Isn't it a little bit like asking why isn't everybody using Postgres instead of Oracle? <laughs> I, I could get behind that since I'm a Postgres guy. But it's, yeah, it's... The, the it's data's already there. It's similar it's to the, that. To make the move, it's, it's expensive and it's destabilized. Could be, but we've been doing this for 25 years. I was doing, look, I was doing people, Oracle people in the late 90s. On Windows have been on that for 25 years. So if all your talent is on Windows, mm -hmm. it, it's destabilizing to move. So, okay, we got destabilizing to move. Some thing, I heard somebody say some things run better on the Windows, which, yeah, I guess we have to admit that if you're going to do something in biz talk, I guess you have to run Windows. Um, well, I don't know. Microsoft's releasing MSSQL for Linux. It's no, out. They already have. They yeah, already have. have. Um, Will.net's out for uh, Linux too, right? Because I know Mon existed. Shut up. All right. <laughs> .NET has been open sourced and been out for over a year. It's yeah, yeah, uh, okay. .NET Core yeah. 2.0 has been released. Okay. And that's available on Linux, and it can run on ARM. Okay. Too much detail, but yes. Yeah. So we've got. There are reasons, right? So. I I um I went through. I did a lot of this. I wrote a lot of stuff down and. What I, what I came to is that we've got a disconnect between the technical world and the business world, okay? Um, and it comes down to these two points. Technology is a tool and business is a process, right? And because of that, there, we're not getting that, that overlap. We're not quite getting the, or let's just say, we've got these two environments and the communication is not the same. We're sort of talking past each other. Uh, tool people, those of us in technology, those of us in this room, we a lot of times want a process. We don't care about the process, right? If you're a programmer, and yes, I do like to pick on programmers quite a bit, um, you know, you, you want to get something done, you don't really care. You're probably looking for a library, especially folks that started programming after 2000. Okay? You want a library, right? I'm guilty of that. Total pro about, right? Probably the only one in here because, no, there's Jeff, my buddy Jeff, <laughs> and I got JP. I got backup. This is awesome. Okay. Uh, and I'm sorry, I keep forgetting your name. Peter. Peter. I was going to click Phil, I'm glad I asked. Peter. All right, so there's four of us. All right. JP, you use pro modules every so often too, right? <clears throat> right? Jeff, you too, right? I'm guilty of it. Absolutely. I know the Python people, you guys are doing your things, Java people in here as well. 
um, we sometimes, as programmers, we just want to get things done. I don't want to think that hard, okay? If I have to open up something and do something low-level file access, yeah, I could do it myself. But you know what? I might just grab a Perl module to do it, to handle it for me. You know, maybe there's some reason I don't want to do that. So, those of us who are using tools, we know we're going to have to do a process to do something, right? Because most programming these days still is somewhat, you know, step by step, which inherently means a process. On the business side, however, they want the tools to get things done, but they don't care about the tools, okay? They don't necessarily care how you're solving the problem, just solve it. In fact, we all know this guy, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> This solve my problem, okay? I don't care how you do it, just go ahead and solve it. And this is one of the, this is one of the, the truths I had to come to, that as excited as I am as a technical person about technology, most people are not. And it's something that I think we have to understand as technical people if we're going to talk to people who are not technical. So the first question, or the first sort of milestone here is, how do we get business to use a particular tool? All right, that's the high level. Specific to us, how do we get business to use Linux and other FOSS tools? DevOps. Right. Say again? DevOps. I'm just <laughs> <laughs> throwing things. Is that a four letter word? <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> so, if there is nothing else you remember from tonight, it's this. Stop talking about <laughs> Linux. Seriously. Just, just stop. Just stop. I can't tell you, especially if we go back to the 90s, early part of this century, how many times I would see people's eyes just, I'd mention Linux or whatever. I mean, if it, if it was... Database Postgres, and they'd go, oh. eyes glazed back, don't care. They've heard of Oracle, at that point, maybe even, and even um, MSSQL. But Postgres, or MySQL, what is that? What are you talking about, you, you young kid, right? Despite the grad was young ones. Um, <clears throat> what I learned very quickly, because I wanted to eat and have nice things, is I had to stop talking about Linux. The, the disconnect is, again, the, 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 the issue. I'm looking at things as a tool, right? They're looking at things as a process, but I'm approaching them talking about the tool. So I had to stop talking about the tool. Let's not talk about Linux. Let's not talk about anything technical, in fact. And those of you who have been around me when I'm talking to business people will know that I never talk tech. I almost never. If someone has to ask me to talk about the how I'm doing something. I never do when I'm in a meeting. So, some hard truths. Uh, the first one we just talked about, uh, business people don't care how slick your solution is. You could, you know, be working on X and you're all excited, you go to a meeting and you start talking tech and their eyes are going to glaze over. All right? Um, for them, and I try to be as insulting as possible, to try to point on, talk about Linux or whatever, is like watching paint dry, and with paint, they got to pick the color, okay? That's how uninteresting it is. Uh, for those of you with spouses or significant others, and you're geeking out in your basement about doing something, you know how it is when the wife comes down and says, what are you working on? And you're like, oh man, this is awesome, I just did this, and she just, well, you know, it's like, okay, whatever, dinner's gonna get cold, I'm going to bed. It just doesn't matter to people who aren't technical. Um, point number two. Geeks, nerds, techies, whatever you're going to call us, you know, today. Um, despite recent TV shows and things like that, yeah, we're still not part of the cool kids, all right? Not in, not in America anyway, okay? Um, some people like Mr. Robot. I know some people don't like Mr. Robot. You know, that might have made things cool for us, but I know I was the only one geeking out about Mr. Robot, so I don't think that's necessarily true. He's a communist. What's that? He's a... <laughs> So JP making a mustache. Uh, um, I think part of not being part of the cool crowd is that technical people, or non-technical people rather, 
don't like to be reminded they're not non-technical. So this is something that I've heard uh, other people talk about when we say the ivory tower, right? Um, if you ever work with PhDs, and I'm sure probably most of you have, um, depending on who you're dealing with, sometimes that gets a little interesting. Um, and, and those of us in this room, our eyes may glaze back like, oh my god. Um, there, sometimes technical people rub each other the wrong way. And this is sort of that last piece here. Um, a lot of times technical people can be jerks. All day, every day. Um, no, no. <laughs> the first um, step is acceptance. However, <laughs> for some reason, uh, however, when I've never seen you at the meetings. <laughs> I, I try to. I do try to downplay it a little bit. Um, the one. The one thing, though, that is not true, especially in this in this group, is that this you know sort of idea that you know geeks are socially awkward. Yeah, that's that's TV. You know, it's fun to make fun of the people that are those guys, and of course, then you need them at the end, and they hack something in like thirty seconds because we got to go to commercial. Um, yeah, like I said, some of this is like TV stuff. The last point is. Um, uh, also a hard truth, but it's probably the one that's maybe most significant. Smart people are expensive, okay? Um, I went to Drexel. The reason why I went to Drexel is because there was co-op. The reason why I wanted co-op is because next door to Drexel is Penn. And I knew in Philadelphia I was going to be competing with Penn students, which was fun because I could go into a job interview and say, I've got six months, 12 months, or 18 months experience and I get the job. And in fact, if you go to Drexel and talk to Drexel students now, and you ask them, they're going to say, I'm here for, for co-op. All right. Other people have other reasons, but I wanted to have as much of this as a really an unfair sort of advantage. And if you went to college to do something, to learn something, to get ahead, you want an unfair advantage in life so that you can do very well. So you became smart because you realized that's how you could get there. Well. We're expensive, okay? You know, that's, that's the reality of it. So I say rightfully so. The problem, the hard truth is that because smart people are expensive, and maybe some of these other things here, some organizations may feel that, you know what? Instead of hiring the smart guy, maybe I'll just buy a product off the shelf. It's cheaper. And products don't ask for vacation. They don't get sick. Right? So, these hard truths are some of the things we have to overcome. Okay. So, any questions so far? Okay. Um, how am I doing on time? I'm actually not watching the actual clock. There's one there, too. Here. Uh, is it accurate? Okay, good. Yeah. All right, good. All right, so, um, what I did was I kind of put together some things on what I found is successful for me. Uh, and again, this is, you know, discussion. So I'm just going to, you know, go through some of these. I don't think, I don't think I'm going to go through all of them. But um, some of the most important ones, I think, for me are, one is the first one. Uh, be an advocate without being a fan. Okay? Again, technical people, we get excited about these things, but we have to remember that we're the ones excited about it, not, other, not necessarily other people, even our own peers doing things. And what we have to understand is that we can be an advocate for something, for a particular piece of technology, for a better way of doing things, um, well, you know, in Linux, but free and open source. Um, we can do that without being a fan. Um, I, I know there are some people in the room who are fans of Python and all <laughs> things Python. Okay, that's great. You like Python, and you could be an advocate for Python, okay? But when you start becoming too much of a fan for things, again, people's eyes glaze over, and they become uninteresting. And I think we're probably all guilty of that, all right? So you have to figure out how to walk that fine line. Um, the second bullet point is, um, again, sort of a uh, something happened to me once upon a time that was somewhat humbling. Um, you got to know what else is out there, right? Because as much as we're going to talk about Linux or open source stuff in this community, we have to know what else is out there. So we can rag on Windows all day, every day. However, we need to make sure that 
we're doing it in a way that if someone goes to verify it, all right, that competitive research, as I put it, our stuff lines up, okay? Um, which leads to third bullet point. Be honest about your experience. <coughs> um, one of the things I found, especially when I was younger, is that um, if you don't have experience with something, it's best to say you don't, all right? Because that's not necessarily a deal breaker. It, when you are, especially if you're in a company that's doing, um, it's more of like a development atmosphere where you're constantly creating things. And there's certain methods and techniques that you may not be familiar with in a particular, in a particular space. So you, you have to get experience. Anybody that's ever done something started at zero experience, right? So why say you have experience with something if you don't? It just doesn't make sense to do it. Um, the other reason I do it more recently is that when, if I'm talking about open source stuff or Linux stuff, and I say I don't have experience with a particular, you know, whatever, whatever the um, issue is, okay, or whatever the um, technology I think can be used in the open source world, but I don't have experience with it, it allows me to talk about the community in a false philosophy, right? Because that's one of the things that we, we have the advantage on. If uh, who, here's, who here works in a mixed environment? I mean that you've got um, Microsoft stuff and you know, everything else. Okay, most people, right? So for your peers, when they get into problems, what do they do? They pick up a phone, right? They have to call somebody. They, you're shaking your head. You don't want to know. It's scary. Okay. <laughs> um, so, and if we take Microsoft, since, you know, like I said, I'm going to pick on Microsoft. Pick up a phone. They call. And they wait on hold, they talk to a guy, maybe they solve a problem, maybe they don't. All right? And that seems to be perfectly accepted currently in, you know, in terms of business practices. There is this idea that if I'm paying money and I can call somebody, somehow that's good and somehow that's, that's better. Um, those of us in here know better than that. If we have a problem, what do, what do we do? We ask each other. We ask each other. We, we hop on IRC. We post to some place, maybe even plugs mailing list. Stack right. Overflow. Exchange. Was that? Stack Overflow, Stack Exchange. St stack, stack Exchange, you know, okay. which is posting. Hmm? Who are you going to call? Who are you going to call? Stack Exchange. Well, <laughs> yeah, you're going to call. Well, actually, that's the that interesting way to put it. Who are you going to call? Not as who are you going to call, but who are you going to call? We've got so many resources. There's a big difference, right? Because we all generally know people that are doing some of the same things we are, right? If I have a Chrome problem, I know I can probably talk to Rich about that, yeah. you know, because I know it's based on Gen 2. Lucky me. So it's right. like AA with computers. That's pretty much how I've always called <laughs> <before. laughs> The other is like, this is, this is group for, for technical people. Go ahead, Phil. Use, oh, you, oh, okay. No, no. I'm sorry. Peter, Phil. Peter, right? Peter. Peter. Bad one. No, I, no I, was, I was about to say, like, even, even if, like, whoever we're asking, like, doesn't have, like, direct experience, like, they might be able to, like, they might be able to, like, you know, go through, like, go along, like, go through like the man page with you and like point you in the right direction. Absolutely. Absolutely. There's um there's um so I'm a New Yorker. In New York we always say we have a guy. Well the nice thing about our field is that there's always a guy and there's a guy who knows another guy as well. Right? Brian. Or, or <laughs> and then there's Brian who takes us on a little Um but the point is that having a conversation, sending someone an email, getting an IRC, that does that costs time, not money. Right? So I like to talk about this quite a bit because it gets people to understand that, well, you may be a, um, a small business owner, which is funny because almost all businesses in America are small businesses yeah. by the very definition. But, you know, you're not the big company with the brand name and everybody's got the jacket, right? You're not them. So what do you have to offer? Why, why are we going to go with your solution? I don't care what the technical is, right? We already discussed that. But why am I going to go with your solution? Well, it's because it's not just me. It's a community of people that I have direct access to. Um, and, and I've won business recently because of that, because I've talked about plug, because I've talked about just the Philadelphia region in general. You know? um, so that's, a, that's one of the things when you're talking to other people, beyond, a, like I said, the technical piece, forget about that. Make things non-technical, but also talk about what your resources are, because that's a big deal. Um, yeah, Keith, another thing you can probably tie into that is multiple supplier options, right? So if it's open, mm -hmm. yep. you know, you're not locked into one, you know, not just like that company or their certified consultants. 
Yep. Um, you know, there are there are the red hats of the world, mm -hmm. but then there's also the key of the world as well. Right. And so, you know, and there's got to be a hundred other people like you in the Philadelphia region. Yep. Not quite like you, but... <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you. <laughs> uh, that's that's absolutely right. That's, um, that, um, uh, maybe about ten years ago, um, there was a situation where I was working for a contractor for the uh, city of Philadelphia, and I found out that some somebody in the city spent a bunch of money on a solution that actually never got rolled out. And, you know, it's not necessarily surprising, but the problem was that money was spent on something that could not then be repurposed, right? So this is the richest point. So let's say you come in, I come in and make a recommendation, and this is actually one of the things I'll talk about. Um, I don't actually quite have it on here, but, um, yeah, that's actually, I might add that one, Rich, that's, that's good. The, the idea is that if we do start a solution, okay, business these days, the word they like to use is agile, right? They want to be able to adapt to things as they change. We know the world is changing very quickly. So if you can do something and implement a solution, but then that solution can be adaptable to other things, you can quote unquote go a different way without having to redo everything from the ground up. That's also very powerful, right? Um, I've talked, I mean, we, someone mentioned Oracle. Um, so we got Oracle's a big one. Uh, actually, anything Microsoft related is going to be a big one. There's certain things these systems don't do. I've seen people buy Oracle installations and it doesn't go anywhere. And now you've got a bunch of Oracle stuff and licensing. And you find you have to go a different database system. Maybe you have to go Microsoft after that, right? Um, I, I, you know, you, you see that in any closed source situation. Um, when you get down to hardware, it's kind of hard to get around that, but, you know, that's an important point, be able to be, adapt to be adaptable to other situations. Um, be okay with hearing no, I think um, that's sort of, uh, we're all adults, if you can't handle hearing no, you should probably be in a different field. Um, be aware of the risk tolerances by stakeholders. This goes back to something I said before we actually started. Uh, if you are doing business or you are in that sort of executive level that you're engaged with, if you're at that point in your career, you really have to start to understand the business side of things a lot more. And you probably, as you've gone through your career, that's probably happened anyway. But this idea of risk, especially these days when we talk about security and other things, um, I've, I've always gotten very positive feedback about talking about things again, from the business point of view, but from that process point of view, and talking about things in terms of risk, okay? This goes back to adaptability. If there's so much risk in doing a solution, and so that if you get too far into it, there's a lot of effort to back out of that solution, that level of risk may not be tolerable. And for some organizations, you, that, that could, you know, in some cases, that could put you out of business, all right? Yes. We mitigate risk with insurance policy. We do. Microsoft licensing an insurance policy. Right? To to a right. point. To a point. To yes. A point. Mm -hmm. Okay. Because they try to mitigate risk. Except for when they randomly because, reboot every Tuesday. Because they have a licensing. The trouble is mm -hmm. sometimes the insurance is too expensive. Sometimes it's too expensive. And it's cheaper. Mm -hmm. okay. Underwrite your own. So I'm just thinking that's a way to sell the risk thing. Uh, yeah, I like to use, um, I think I, I use J, JP, which is keep your exact Keep signature. yourself insured sometimes. Yeah, but you talk about the Microsoft tax, Go I think. Go back a slide. Go back a slide? Oh. Yeah, I was just going to ask that too. Like, where, where does the overhead of keeping track of all those licenses move that point? Too? Well, again, that's, that's the cost of the yeah. insurance. <clears throat> Right. That's, yeah, that's, I think, a very good point. I used to use a similar phrase in the JPs where I talked about the tax of Microsoft. If I, now this is a Chromebook, but if I buy a laptop, I've got Microsoft stuff on there and all the FUD that comes with it, right? So, now, granted, it's going to get wiped and all thing, but in the meantime, I put money into Microsoft's pocket, which is why when you look at Microsoft's reporting on Windows, they talk about how many people are, are licensing, which is active, which is initial licensing, really. When you look at renewals, those numbers are completely different. They don't like to talk about that. 
If, you, if you've never listened to a quarterly call from Microsoft, um, they are streamed public. Uh, you should do it at least once. It, it would probably be very entertaining to most of us in here. It's very interesting. It's almost as good as listening to an Apple one. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, it's... it's or, yeah. <laughs> I've listened to an no, Intel next one. Next quarter's Intel one? I want to, I want to listen next to that. Next quarter. We should, we should actually make a, a thing of that. Next quarter's Intel. Uh, Let's one. make it a drinking game. Yeah, or even AMDs. <laughs> but that, that's, some of this, for the closed source companies and other companies we've talked about, some of this stuff can get very interesting. But it's this idea of effort and time spent and, and the points that JP and, and Peter were just making. Um, you got to, you've, and, and risk means something different to every organization, but if, again, in your career, if you're sort of in that senior level, you're going to understand how to talk about risk for your organization. Um, like I said, in my experience, that's been appreciated, by, especially the numbers folks, all right? Because if you're going to spend a bunch of money on something that is an unknown or a risk, but there are people who want it because they're trying to open up a new business line, and you come at things from the risk point of view and say, well, you know what, maybe instead of going this way, we put more money into people and hire devs and, and people that do things the open source way because we can leverage the community. Um, they're going to listen, okay? That that I, I I would I'd be surprised if they wouldn't even I'd be surprised if they wouldn't want to at least engage in a conversation to find out more about what you're talking about. Um, all right, so let's see how am I doing here? All right. Any other, any other ones? Actually, we can stay there. Any other, any other ideas, feedback? How, let me ask you this. How, because how, we're all in open source here, how have you guys done in terms of being able to get solutions implemented where you are? Any, 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 any um, pearls of wisdom that you could share with the group here? I'm just, I'm just thinking, um, you, you, the first thing you said was don't talk, don't, you, don't say the word Linux, uh, so it just kind of goes against that, but uh, so, let's talk about Fight Club for a second. Um, <laughs> the, the, years ago, everybody was terrified of not using IBM. Okay? Mm -hmm. We can't use Microsoft. It's got to be, it's got to be a mainframe. That's not true. Look what happened. Okay? Oh, wait a minute. We, we can't use, we can't use Google. Uh, we're using Microsoft. Mm. What, what web browser is running the, the internet right now? Well, you just told us. Well, Scrum, right? Yeah, yeah it's Scrum. Yeah. Okay. So. Okay. So, mm -hmm. I mean, you already said you, mm -hmm. we're, we're look at the growth. You look at the growth path. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, it doesn't take much to see the writing on the wall. This is the growth path. It, it, it probably isn't going to level off. So. Right. You know. I I think at this point in 2018 is critical mass, and it's probably okay to say it. But as that slide said at the bottom, you don't talk about it first. No. You know, no, you, you, right. you, you talk about solving the problem, addressing the pain point, and then when someone asks you the how question, you go, oh, we're, we're, we're using Lynx for that. And they go, oh, okay, yeah, I've heard of that. It's, it's 90, you know, 100% of the, you know, high performance computing. Yeah. When I started out way back, you know, late 60s, 70s, mainframes were being displaced. And operations within a company could actually own their own computer. And they, when they were backing up data, they were backing up their data. They weren't doing the payroll, they weren't doing mm -hmm. the right. general ledger, they were doing their problem. It was their computer. And what I tell my customers is, you know, I'm going to solve your problem. Yes. Problem now. Mm -hmm. This is your problem. Right. And the software will never be done because as the software is running, you want to get visibility other things that you may want to do. Right. And because it's open source, because I control the source code, because I control the hardware, mm -hmm. I can implement, would you imagine? Yes. That's very good. Yeah. That's, if you can get to that point in, in, in a initial meeting, you're most likely getting business. I, I've, I've gotten there with people eventually, the idea that you own everything and you can pretty much do whatever you want. Um, because I still, it's not just me. I'm not the smartest guy around. But I know a lot of smart people. <laughs> okay. Well, you know, I, I go in there like with the semiconductor test systems. You have an operator. I said, well, why isn't an operator logging on? You know, with the software or power that we have today as opposed to 40 years ago, mm -hmm. I can tell you what operator is. You can chart productivity. How many parts per hour mm -hmm. is that? You know, things that will piss off an operator. But, the, you know, if you've ever been in a production environment, 
these people live and die on numbers. Yes. So if you can measure, right. Before you can fix anything, you got to be able to measure. Right. So if you can put in measurement capabilities, where there was never any measurement capabilities. Okay. You Having got, the you got a system like will never be resolved because it can always okay. be improved. Okay, so you're saying having more, having a better feedback in your solutions because right. you're you going to solve the problem. You know, we know what mm -hmm. you've been doing. Mm -hmm. We know what you want to continue doing. Right. But we can make it better. Right. We can, as we find things, we can test them. We right. Can yep. Implement them. Right. Hardware is coming out that's new. We don't have to wait every 20 years and say we got to do catch up. We can catch up on a yearly basis. Good point. Okay. Any others? You guys are holding on to the pearls of wisdom. <laughs> All right. Well, got a little bit of time left. Um, I had a couple of examples of some things I've done. Um, I'm not sure how relevant it is, but maybe the first thing I wrote was is kind of interesting. So this is in the late 90s. I wrote this program I called Load Watch, and what it did, my first company was a, a level two ISP and at one point we were hosting someone who had a uh, like some sort of image archive um, PG stuff not archival stuff <laughs> and um, it, he just started he was getting so much tra traffic he was crashing the server every every day and when I say crashing he was locking it up so that nothing else was being processed okay and I we couldn't remote in we'd have to someone would have to go to the machine and, and reboot it we didn't like doing that. So what I ended up doing is writing a program to just monitor the, uh, the system load. And there was sort of a small window where we could detect when we there was going to be a problem. And this program would watch to see if the load went back down. If it didn't, it would just reboot the system. All right? And it would make an entry in the system logs. Now, back then, that was weird, right? Because in the 90s, we were still in this era of, hey, it's cool, my server's been up for a hundred something days, right? Remember that game? Where you, you know, Netware 1, right? We all know that, okay? I know people that network servers up for like years without rebooting. I think that's stupid now, okay? <laughs> uh, but back then, it was all about uptime. Well, I didn't care about uptime, I cared about accessibility and everybody getting service, not just one guy with this one website who was doing everything. Uh, this also forced me to get into better kernel, you know, tuning and some other things. But at the end of the day, this little piece of code, which uh, doesn't do much, there's, there's, this is all system call stuff. There's something in the kernel. You send that system call, it drops the server like a hot potato. Um, this is also after XFS became available, so it was safe to do that. Um, safe in quotes. That one, that one was uh, pretty interesting. This last one I, was for the uh, city. That, um, that I was working for them. This is also another network product pre OES2, which is OES2 is when network finally got rid of the DOS stuff and started doing things on top of Linux. Um, but what this allowed um, the people responsible for the network service to do is see all of the critical parameters for those systems and be able to get ahead of where there may be problems. So. If you, if you read the language on here, you'll see, I'll say solved, um, here, solved. This stuff is probably, some of this stuff is on my LinkedIn, um, some of it's on my resume, most of it's not in this sort of detail, but there are things that I keep with me if I'm talking to somebody as a, um, you know, I'll say, what have you done? And I'll give things like this, but I want you to note the language. I'm not really talking about anything technical, I'm talking about solving problems. So are the comments like that in your resume? Are the comments like this in specifically in my resume? No, no. On his website, maybe. <laughs> on my website? <laughs> maybe. No, they're not on the website either. Uh, it's very, like I said, it's it's very, it's very non-technical. Only thing on my website about open source is the about the company piece. Um, let me see. Linux routers, being now, uh, nothing new actually there. Um, yeah, I mean, I've got some newer things just in the last couple years, but really, it's all, I put this stuff on here just because of the, the, the language. I wanted to see how, I wanted you to see how I was describing the solutions. Again, nothing talking about the technology specifically, just talking about what's getting solved. Uh, and that's why I 
included this, included this stuff. But everybody in here could do a similar thing, and you probably, if you have a resume, you probably have. Uh, if you're doing any sort of business operations yourself, um, you probably have something right up some solutions you've done. You could you could give somebody to talk about. Uh, same thing. The most important thing on my website for my company are the testimonials, which is now custom my customers talking about what was done in the problem it solved. And that's literally the most important link on, on my website. And the feedback I get is that, yeah, I called you because I saw you did something for somebody else, and we think this is similar. You know, can we talk? Uh, so that's it. I got plus five minutes. Any comments, questions, more discussion stuff? I really want to hear more from you guys. This is, this is just my stuff. I don't care. <laughs> I think security is a big issue. Security is a huge issue. Especially right now. <laughs> well, you know, people, uh, I'm not surprised being able to access customer data. Mm -hmm. you know, so if a salesman gets pissed off, he takes that with him. Thumbs it to you. So my data, you're talking about internal data leaks, right. essentially. Yeah. Data. Yeah, being able data to loss. You know, secure your data, being able to limit access, you know, not having a wide open platform like oh Windows. Um, this particular one, this is the main service my company does, and one of the things about this one I'm talking about is that it prevents against ransomware, which is a, a, sort of a data leak thing. Yeah, if if but, you're using Linux and you don't really need to be on the internet, why are you on the internet? Everybody's on the internet. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah, I'm saying. <laughs> Have you ever tried I mean, using Facebook? You're going to take it from my like cold dead hands. <laughs> <laughs> if you're running in a production environment, you don't, need, bit you don't need it unless you need it. <laughs> this so is Texas. Want, my hairdresser has the internet. Yeah, I, as oh, I say, it's, sorry, I, I, know, I understand what you're saying, and it it is the right statement to make. It is, it is very hard to sell that in practice. Now, Keith, how can you call yourself an information security professional if you do not know every single port that's open anywhere on the network? <laughs> you just said you're not Linuxy enough. I, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I don't. I, I. I am. My my master's is in security. That's part of what I studied at the master's level. Um, I don't. I, you know, it's hard to say. You know, you're 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 this or that. Um, you know, I'm always finding something new. I remember I start, first started doing voice over IP. You had to learn how that worked, and there's a whole other set of ports. Or, you know, if you're doing Postgres stuff, and uh, you know, policies are one thing, and it's, and I'll get that as well. Like, how do you not know this stuff? I don't know if you, how many of you guys have done like technical interviews where you, they you, you sit in front of a group like this and they say, "Here's the problem, solve it." Clock starts now, and you've got to like whiteboard something or whatever. Oh, yeah. I always thought things like that were rather pretentious because you're sitting in from a room of people that already know the answer and you you you've got to do this on your feet oh, which, no, no, no. which Even is fine, worse, but they don't know the answer they're asking you and you should, you should be have, sending them sending them a bill yes, I, yes. yes. <laughs> it's free consulting um, I've been there and I'll what I've always said is that I'll I will give you a high level but I'm not going to solve it because of that mm -hmm. um, there that was a I guess that that continues to be a problem I find that a lot of people they want to get information out of you for free, which is fine at some point, but if you know I'm just a, I'm well, not how else do VCs work? <laughs> <laughs> I haven't had enough alcohol yet. <laughs> um but no, Rich, I think that's a, that's a point. I mean, you know, I, I, I was actually just joking yeah. with that, but actually, I want to ask no, a serious point. thing. So, when you're you know pitching Linux or whatever else, you know, is this mostly in the context of custom software, which some of those examples are? Cause mm -hmm. You know, my experience when you start with a business problem, more often than not, you first end up looking for an application or a CAN solution. Right. And then the operating system becomes second. Because so you can find a CAN solution. Mm -hmm. Okay, now if they tell you, oh, this will run on these operating systems, well, that may be, but then inevitably, well, of course, I'm in a big company, but your mm -hmm. server group of the sides, they pick which one they want. Right. But the... You know, the reality is, though, a lot of solutions are only available on one operating system, and if so, well, guess what you're using? There's that, but that's what this piece is, the competitive research and also the narrative on why the Linux solution might be better. Because you're right, there's, there's a lot of times where we know things are only on Windows, and someone will say, I, I, I want this. One of the biggest issues I had back in the 90s was that Oracle was a big deal back then. Well, Oracle only ran on certain things. So if I had a customer that was a sun shop, okay, we didn't like the 
group I was with, they didn't like doing anything on Sun. They were an HP UX shop. Anyone here ever use HP UX? <laughs> Half my databases are running on it. Worst Unix on the planet, right? Am I, am I, am I sort of right? I, I can't think of anything that's really worse than it. It was, it was, it was uh, miserable. Like either that one or AIX. Either, either, either one. E yeah, I, I go back and forth. I, I, yeah, they, yeah, they, they, that they were one and two. <laughs> I, I, I think yeah. Sperry had a Unix that was worse. I, think I used original Bell Labs <laughs> Linux 2.0. Linux 2.0? Oh, sorry, uh, Unix, Unix, Unix 2.0. <laughs> um, yeah, it's... I'm trying I, not to go to the dark side of BSD man here. you have years of Java experience too, right? <laughs> <laughs> oh, fuck. Well, that's good. Um, there was a hand in, in the... Behind... Did you have a comment? No, I was just going to oh. say, I may think it worked. The only reason there is an HP UX is somebody probably did a benchmark and found that was the highest... Transactions per second per dollar handed to Oracle, you know, with running on <laughs> HPUX, and yeah. so hence we're running on HPUX. Yeah, I mean, it happens. It's hard to get. I mean, another thing I was, I was doing tonight is the CA Unit Center, and that only, and actually, that was the opposite. That ran on Sun, so I was, I was ecstatic, you know. But <laughs> if, if someone was an HPUX shop, they were upset. So we have that, you know, back then, but now a lot of it is, you're right. What's the what's the current solution that what's the best solution out now? You start there, and then if it's not, you have to look at well, is it does it just not run on Linux? And if it answers no, okay, do we do we develop the same sort of thing? You know, which you know some people like doing it, some people mm -hmm. some people don't. But one of the things I have found as a technical person, which I didn't mention before, is unlike salespeople, technical people have what they call a hundred percent close ratio. And by that I mean when we recommend something because there's an inherent trust of technical people generally we're not necessarily out for the because again we're, we're geeks, we're not really out for the money, we're doing this because we enjoy doing it. There's an inherent trust which is why this stuff becomes important because we don't want to break that trust. Right? When you're dealing with sales people it's the exact opposite. People don't want to do it sometimes because it's a salesperson they assume they're being taken advantage of. Right? All right? So one of the things I learned early on is that if in, embrace the inner geek, okay, but also understand all the non-technical stuff so I don't break the trust. Well, if I'm talking to somebody, people can pick up pretty quickly that I'm not a, a salesperson, okay? And I'm whole and you know, really good people know that, like, okay, I need to know more. Because some people are testing, they want to know how technical you are, because they know salespeople, we they used to be a thing called pre-sales, right? Which was supposed to be the technical guy was a sales guy. It's not a thing, but you know that it it was at one time, uh, and some people know that, so they want to see if this if you are as technical as you say you are. So I find that the how piece here is also about maintaining trust. Other comments? Oh, yeah. You know, on, on that issue, I think you're a hundred percent right because I used to tell people I, I I'm not a sales pimp. Salesperson, I can't lie to you. You know, I know, uh -huh. you know what the reality is, and, right. I, and I have these questions, mm -hmm. but I'm not going to give you, you know, yes, no, you shouldn't have any problem. Yeah. You know, that kind of line mm -hmm. because I know better. Yeah, be okay. Where is it? Uh, I mentioned on here. Uh, oh, wait, I've been on the last side. Let me it's just... okay to say you do not know? Yeah, it's okay to say, so this is my closing point. Uh, it's okay to, what's well, not on here? Um, <laughs> I thought it was. It's okay to say you don't know. But that, was on, that was on the first slide. Yeah. Before you. Did I have it there? Okay. It was like the first or second, but yeah. I thought I had it in there. It wasn't sometimes. with Terminator. Come on. Um, yeah. That's keep it simple, stupid. Is 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 far and away the best thing you can do. Yeah. yeah. Complexity is um, worse. And worse. Less secure. Yeah. I I don't I know what you guys, but the older I get, the simpler I want things. Okay. I just I just can't take things being overly complicated anymore. Just not not because I can't work through it, but because I've got better things to do with my time, you know. And I think a lot of times there's just going back to the paid support and closed source model. There was this idea that um, you know I actually took an HP uh, you know HP UX certification test. Uh, it went horrible, but it's because HP UX I think they just overly complicated their system, you know. Uh, Oracle as a database. It's just overly complicated. It's, it's miserable. <laughs> okay? And I'm sure we've all worked on things that are miserable, and when you look at it, you go, this makes no sense. Who the hell did this? You know? And for me, it's like, okay, they made it complex because they wanted to be better, because they knew they were going to sell certifications and all this other stuff 
around their stuff and give this impression that, hey, you know, you're certified in this, so you, this must be better. And it's, you know, forgive me for saying, but it's all BS. It is much, much harder to write something that's simple. And, and, I, and I, I remember someone told me that once. You know, that I was, I don't know what I was doing. I was, we were working on some sort of programming thing, and a guy said one page. You know, here's the font. So I forget how many lines it actually ended up being, but he said, one page. He said, you can't do it in one page. You're just not, you're not thinking hard enough. This is not more than a page. And it was humbling because not only could none of us do it in a page, but when he showed us the solution and how simple it was, you ever hear the term sim simplicity leads to elegance or something yeah, along yeah. those lines? Perfection is not when you can't add anything else. It's when you can't take anything else away. Yeah. Along, something yeah. along those lines. Yeah, I've heard that too. Yeah. It's, it's along those lines. I, I didn't have an appreciation because I'm much more of an engineer than a, than a programmer. But this idea that if something is simple and it does everything you need, okay, everything you need, you know, not, we're not sacrificing anything. If you could do something simple that does that, that's elegant, okay? If it's simple, the next person coming after you can look at it and, and, and pick it up. That's where we want to be. We don't want things that are complex. Life is difficult as is. We don't need things to be more complex. We need things to be simpler. And um, one of the other things here that also irks me is that new isn't better. This, this is probably the thing that irks me the most these days because, yeah, we want innovation. Yeah, we want new things to come out, and I'm fine with that, okay? I like learning new things, too. But this idea that new is better, that's one that I, I, I don't get, you know? There's a huge open source benefit there mm -hmm. that open source improvements and changes are driven by actual need yes. for them, yes. not the marketing department saying you have to come out with a new version by Christmas. Right, right. Yeah, that, came, right, that filters out this idea that here's the new thing just because, and there's a bunch of things wrong where... You know, it's frustrating to some people, they say, well, what's the new version? And you'll say, there is no new version. Well, this hasn't changed in two, three years. Yeah, no one's found, no one, sometimes we get it right. <laughs> you know, no one's found a bug. And I, I'll hear that with other open source projects, too. It's like, oh, I'll see people say, oh, this hasn't been modified in two, three years. And I'll look at, I'll look at it and go, well, maybe because it works. It, yeah, because it works. I mean, sometimes we get it right. You know, it doesn't happen a lot, but sometimes we get it right. So, um, all right, guys, thank you for coming. Um, we can uh, pick this up. I'm going to Applebee's. We usually adjourn there. But uh, thanks for coming, and I hope you guys like this talk. And again, there's my information if you need it. But um, thanks a lot. Thank you.